it should be a very important part of our Christian life, and that is prayer. Today we are asking the simple question, how does God answer my prayer? Please note that this is also not a lesson attempting to explain all the ways that a spiritual and sovereign God can, could, and in many respects still does, work to bring about the answering of his children's prayers. I would love to address that sometime. I trust that we've all learned that even our human 2020 hindsight vision is still so limited that we simply can't fathom all the ways that God proves capable of producing certain blessings or preserving us through and sparing us from certain varied tragedies. But I do trust that we've all occasionally attempted to uncover the trail of variables that have led to certain blessings in our lives. And our minds are always stunned, rendered, and left to see how God worked, at least by the factors we could see. And then we just hit a wall and realize there are things beyond our ability to ever control that is not out of God's control. It is not for us to see all the ways or to understand everything, but it is our established faith that pleases God, our trust in Him. And God tells us so much about prayer. God has always promised us so much about prayer. And these are just a few verses on the subject. And I'm always aware that that, uh, uh, that they have their own contextual meaning. But I also want you to know that there is spiritual truth about prayer implied or mentioned within these verses. Going all the way back to Exodus chapter 22, verse 23. I'll read the, these series of verses. If they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. God speaking about the children of Israel. Psalm 34, 15 through 17. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them and delivers them out of all their trouble. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to those who call upon Him, to those who call upon Him in truth. So The Bible goes further and says that He doesn't just hear our prayers, but that God answers. God answers. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. The words of Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, or to him who knocks. Let's see, knock, and it will be opened. For to everyone who asks, receives. And to he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Mark chapter 11, verse 24. I say to you, whatever things you ask for in prayer, believe that you receive them, and you'll have them. James 5.16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous avails or accomplishes much. It's very powerful and effective. Wow. These are great verses. These are, that sounds great, because it is great, but there's a problem. Many Christians either don't believe or haven't yet realized the power and assurance of prayer that these verses promise in their own prayer life. Those who doubt the power of prayer 
for one reason or another, are not fully experiencing the abundant life in Christ. You're simply not. So instead of prayer being a source of great confidence and hope and encouragement and endurance and perseverance and focus, for many believers, it's more of a source of great frustration. Why is that? Well, the Bible does teach that there are some reasons why prayers are not answered. That's not the primary focus of our lesson today, but it will have to be the first half of this lesson. Uh, Some prayers are not answered, and it's an appropriate time to mention a few reasons why. The first reason comes from, and before we put the blank word, (laughs) the word in the blank on the screen, let's read James chapter 4, verse 2. This reason comes from James chapter 4, verse 2. James says, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask God. Let me make a transition for application. So many believers are stressing through life, frustrated regarding prayer because they simply don't pray. Now, most Christians talk about prayer, but I fear that many have developed a view or begin to think that, well, since God knows the desires of my heart, They take a lazy and selfish approach and say, well, just wanting something, God knows I want it. That's the same thing as praying for it. Absolutely not. Prayer is a spiritual discipline with specific blessings to be gained by its regular practice. Think of the millions of blessings categorized under these three groups. Things like a maturing relationship with God, character development, a heavenly perspective as you walk through each day of life with wisdom and focus, knowing the decisions to make in wisdom. Uh, the, the blessings by a spiritual discipline not practiced don't come. So if you want a frustrated prayer life, just never get still to pray to God and talk to God on a regular basis. It's amazing what that will do for you. We need to both be humble and disciplined to make that time to pray. Our second reason comes from James, again, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. James 1, 6 and 7. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That man shouldn't think he'll receive anything from the Lord. Let that man think he'll receive nothing from the Lord. Second reason for a frustrated prayer is when we just don't ask in faith. Weak faith, weak prayers. Hopefully, well, in, in, in some respects, to a weak God. But ours is the Almighty, and we trust in Him. We would need to intensely, intently, and, and intensely examine our relationship with God, our heart with God. If we could think that we could just go through the motions in prayer while doubting Him the whole time. God forbid. Some doubt whether God even intends to answer prayer or has the power to. God does not have to prove anything to such a person more than what he's already proven to the world through Christ. He died for each one. So yes, we are special. God hears our prayers. Third reason. Third reason for a frustrated prayer life is back in chapter 4, verse 3. James 4, verse 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Third reason for a disappointed prayer life, pure selfishness. But I was going to use this for the Lord. What I wanted, I was going to use it later for the Lord. Wait, what? How many people view prayer as only asking for only what you want? Perhaps like giving a drive through food order, something like, uh, yeah, God, I'd like to have a new car, a new job, a nice house, and healthy family will complete my order. Thank you. Now, I've prayed for those things, of course, but what's my motive? Too many people get nothing out of prayer because they just pray selfishly. The Bible also teaches another reason for a frustrated prayer. It's there, but you have to look for it. It's a clue in Psalm 66, verse 18. Way back in Psalm 66, 18. If I regard or favor iniquity or wickedness in my heart, the Lord would not hear. The NIV says it this way. The Lord would not have listened if I had 
cherished sin in my heart. Do we have cherished sin in our heart that we are choosing to harbor, choosing to favor and prefer rather than using Christ's power to conquer? Good question. If there is unrepented sin in our lives that we are even making provision for, that Romans and Paul tells us not to do, that we will hinder God from hearing our prayers. Let's review this checklist. Are we praying? Are we praying in faith? Is our prayer life fundamentally selfish? And are we harboring some sin deep down in our life that we, we're really not sorry for? We, I, I actually anticipate doing it again. Well, discussing why prayers aren't answered was worth our time. But must we must mention that many Christians have gone through this list and, and feel like they truly can check each point point. say, yes, I am praying, and I, I feel like I am praying in faith. I don't think I'm at the core selfish uh, and I don't think I'm, to my knowledge, feeding a pet sin, but are still doubting. Or, or I should say not doubting, but they're still struggling with a drought of spiritual blessing in their prayers. One lesson can't address every concern, but I hope that what we will address in the next few minutes will help you tremendously in your personal prayer life. The second half will help you because God is, in fact, answering our prayer. Oh, yes. He answers the prayers of his children. The answer is rooted in one little Aramaic word. Helping us understand how God answers prayer is rooted in an Aramaic word that Jesus used when teaching his disciples how to pray. And it's, you know, we call it the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And it speaks well of the Jewish scribes of the day and throughout many years that they would only write or speak the names of God if following certain rules of ritual and purification. They surely would not take the Lord's name in vain verbally. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. But no wonder that with the conditioned view of the Jewish community, the word he used to teach them how to pray stunned them, left them speechless, and challenged their perspective of God. Jesus is the Son of God, so we would not be surprised by this now, but he did teach that you and I can reverently address God with a certain word of such closeness that it completely changes how we see our relationship with the Almighty. That word is Abba. Abba. In English, we get the translated words, Our Father, but that is... I will, and you know where I'm going with this, if you already know the point, the English word that best conveys the closeness that is implied by that word is dad. On the back side of the cross, I cannot say for sure how the disciples reacted to that or what they thought about that. But on this side of an empty tomb, we all have a pretty good concept now of how all of those who've been baptized and resurrected are God's reborn children. Not just by creation, but by redemption. And I hope to remind you, perhaps like maybe never before, that how significant this word Abba is. It tells us everything we need to know about our relationship with God. How God looks at us. How he wants us to look at him. And regardless of the home life that you came from, regardless of the home life you came from. With good study, the phrase, Our Father, Abba, Our Father, can pretty much sum up our whole relationship with Him. Paul uses this term in Romans 8, and it's the term that helps us know how God answers prayer. Let's try to imagine, not just a good father, but let's imagine, to the best our finite minds can, a perfect father. So let's now reword the question. How does the Almighty of creation, a perfect father, respond to the needs and requests of his growing, maturing children? Well, I'll tell you how. He will give them everything they really need. Can you imagine them having a legitimate need being withheld? No, he's perfect. Recall Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Parents, if your children are hungry and asked to sink their teeth into some bread, 
would you give them a rock that would break their teeth instead? Or if they asked to bite into some fish, would you give them a serpent instead that would bite into them? No. He, he talks about that word evil. People have talked about that a lot. You know, since, we're, since humanity is sinful, humanity sins, no human will ever be perfect, i.e., there will be no perfect parent. But even in our sin, we know the difference between what is beneficial or harmful to our kids. How much more does God know best what is best for his children? God will give us everything we really need. And I'll be quick to say, he already has. No matter what you face from this point forward on planet Earth, he has already given us everything we need. I plan to eat some lunch soon. I hope I think you do as well. To keep this body alive another day. But physical food won't keep this body alive forever. If I have Jesus, I can live forever. Appreciate the amen. God has given us everything we really need. But he doesn't stop there. He gives us more. Remember Matthew 6, verses 31 through 32, that Sermon on the Mount here? Jesus is preaching against our anxieties. Don't worry about those basic needs. Your Heavenly Father knows you need them just like the people who don't believe that God has already provided them, and, and he'll still provide for you. The emphasis, your Heavenly Father knows, and he will provide like a perfect father. He'll give us what we need. Point two. That doesn't mean that he will give us everything we want whenever we want it. <laughs> Do parents enjoy taking their kids down the toy aisles? You don't have to answer that, especially if your kids are close to you. If their kids are with you, they're listening extra closely right now, trying to figure out what's he going to say about this. We know that kids can point and ask and cry and... and uh, make a scene and not sure why they just didn't get whatever they wanted to get and why you who loved them didn't get it for them just because they're alive and they're going the whole way home crying because of this and angry at you because of this and and then not yet realizing how it may have started out as one reason they didn't get it and now their attitude is another reason they're not getting it right Terry's still working on me on that I go down the Tory aisles myself just letting you know why do godly parents who could afford buying those toys still just not get their children everything they want whenever they want it? The parent loves them. Mindful of the real them, their developing attitudes and mindsets, they don't want them to become corrupted, selfish, spoiled, but to mature and to always be grateful. Godly parents know the implication of James 4, 3, that it would distract them from who they are to be and their purpose for life, the direction they see it going and why they're here. It would simply ruin them. And the same principle is true for God and all of his still maturing children. I imagine the rebuttal, though. Michael, your illustration uses children who don't yet understand certain things, but I'm an adult. I understand the reasons why I'm asking for what I'm asking. <laughs> uh, as I consider God's omniscience, which frankly I can't, no one can fathom, I humbly accept that the gap or the disparity between my understanding and God's is, uh, is far greater than the gap of my understanding and any child's understanding. There's a far greater disparity between my understanding and God's than between my understanding and any child. And that same is true for all of us. He knows what I need. And he knows that what I want. And the timing of its giving could destroy me or about the timing of its request. I love looking back at many of my old requests, and I do have a prayer journal that goes back quite a ways. No surprise there, I know. Thanking God for how he knew better than to give me some of the things that I earnestly prayed for and asked for. That's the wisdom and kindness of a godly father. The third 
reason, or the third way God answers prayer, is by making us wait. Here is another dynamic of that physical parent-child relationship. There are times, there are times when a specially desired gift is bought and given. It seems that those purchases are commonly not made or given on the day that they're first spotted and expressed desired of, a uh, desired expression of. For many reasons, a godly parent wants his or her child to maybe practice sifting through their emotions to find out how much they really want it. Would it be a frivolous purchase, an item just tossed in the trash the next day? Or would it become an item, or would the item become an icon of a cherished sentiment for years to come and deeply appreciated and let that gratitude carry over to the giver upon reception? Godly parents, have you noticed that if a child learns patience by waiting the right way, it's likely he or she will probably appreciate having that item more and even stay maybe grateful in spirit on the days they don't get gifts. Do you think God ever feels that way about us? If you don't, I reference John chapter 11. It may sound odd to use that chapter if you know the context, uh, and, and as I'm reminding us all, but look at John chapter 11 through this lens and see what you find. Jesus got the word from two of his be- about uh, got word from two of his best friends that Mary and Martha, of course, and their brother Lazarus. Lazarus was critically ill. Lazarus had died. The circumstances in this context were doubly life-threatening. Okay, I get that there's a lot going on, but Jesus did something very unusual. He just stayed where he was for a few extra days. And he eventually made his way back to Bethany, but by now, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Imagine what Mary and Martha could have been thinking. Where is he? Why didn't he come? He can heal this man. Martha meets him on the outskirts as he's arriving and says, Oh Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Can you imagine, some of you can imagine the, the, the sorrow and grief that they experienced those days. I suppose Jesus could have come six days earlier and healed a sick man. But he purposely came later and proved a lot of things by healing a dead man. Mary and Martha suffered during that time. And yet, in during what they went through, they were able to see. God was able to show them something they otherwise could not have seen. Jesus. What did they see? Jesus, the Lord of life, truly is the resurrection. He won't just be at the resurrection. He won't just cause the resurrection. He is the resurrection. Wow. Think about last week, the trials that we talked about and hopefully helped you with in perspective. We've all had hard times where it was very hard to wait for what we did not exactly get (laughs) and what we asked for. As you look back at many of those difficult moments, I hope you see a couple things. I hope you see that not only did they sharpen your spiritual vision, but also blessed your relationship and your walk with God beyond measure. Hard to say, but is that not the most important thing? But I hope that you also see that what God eventually gave you proved to be better than what you ever asked for. I was hoping I'd have a countenance because in my notes I wanted to make sure as I think about my dating days for over a decade, I thank God for my wife. She blesses my soul and my ministry beyond words. Our Heavenly Father does answer our prayers by making us wait. Number four, God answers in a way that's best for the child and the whole family. We are part of a family. Whenever a parent does something that one Children wants, you know, you give one gift to one children, you have to think about the others. Whenever you do something for one, you have to think about the effects and the consequences it will have on the rest of them. 
we will occasionally have to sacrifice our preferences out of our consideration for another. That's good to learn. That's good to learn in the church family. Godly parents then must make many decisions and with far-sighted judgment. I encourage you to read this week 2 Corinthians, of course, and focus on chapter 12 on this light. Paul pleaded with God three times, three different times, uh, to just heal something about his body that was some thorn in the flesh, believing it would help him be more effective in his ministry. <laughs> but God said no. 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 I will take care of you. But the answer was still no. Trust me, I know best. Read that epistle. See if you discover the same thing Paul discovered that he necessarily couldn't put into words. And be thankful that God was considering even you to deny Paul's request. What an incredible thought. For the sake of the body, for all of us, not going to remove thorn, Paul's thorn. But we can know that God knew exactly what was best. Let's keep that in mind when we give our requests to God. And then fifth, as children, <laughs> ideally as they mature, there aren't as many answers needed since they gradually... Stopped asking for as much. They stop asking for as much. I suppose it's both a reward and a relief uh, to the parents after their children have grown past that give me stage into adulthood that they're looking to give more than to receive. Do you think that maturing process is mirrored for the child of God? Oh, yes. James chapter 1, verse 5 promises that God will help us grow in wisdom. Let's make some connections here. Wisdom. What types of things are we praying for now? You know, God loves to listen to our prayers. It's beneficial for us, for sure. And yet, one way he answers many of our requests is with greater wisdom. Just letting us grow. <laughs> okay, just letting us grow up. He lets his children mature. Have you ever noticed that difference in your prayers? I don't know how many years you've been a Christian, but if you've consistently grown as you should, if you've been a Christian for long, you've probably changed your style of praying. It's not give me as much as it used to be. But you're probably filling your prayers with sentiments like these. Praise you, God. Thank you, God. Teach me, God. And to better honor you, use me, God. I hope that we've all been blessed by the points today. I hope all that we've said will help us better understand and appreciate how God answers our prayers. Like a perfect father responding to his children. In closing, I like Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. Feel free to read those on your own time and appreciate all the things that we've said today. One of the, it's one of the many passages I would encourage you to highlight in your copy of the Bible because it reminds me, it reminds all of us that God does not just hear our prayers. Oh, he hears. But he also fully understands everything about our request because he fully understands us and all things, all dynamics. That means he knows what's best and he does act upon our prayers. Prayer is a wonderful privilege for the child of God, for those who are in him. My question for you as you see the gospel reenacted is, are you in him? According to truth, praying to God in truth was a factor we studied today. I want to be in him according to truth. How does his word tell me I enter him and all of his blessings? The faith that responds to his prescribed pattern to die to yourself and by his power have your sins washed away, by your faith in his power have your sins washed away, that you're risen to walk in newness of life by the power of the spirit that he gives. Much more happens whenever there's a baptism than our physical eyes will ever see. But by the life we live, it proves the genuine life and faith in Christ. Do you need to put Christ on in baptism?
or in some way pray for the things that have been part of your life that have been revealed today. Maybe a cherished sin in your life that you want eliminated by the power of Christ to help you experience these blessings only in Christ. If that be your need today, let's respond as we stand.